It's uh, our tradition at First Church that a confirmand delivers the Confirmation Sunday sermon. I'm speaking today because Mala and Aaron asked me if I would. And if you'd like to set the stopwatch function on your phones, we can see how long it takes to make them regret it. <laughs> In our reading today, the apostles asked Jesus, when will they see Jerusalem liberated? And he tells them, it's not for you to know. The apostles, even those closest to Jesus are still told, trust me, have faith. Faith is hard because faith is not certainty. It's especially hard when you're 14. Developmental psychologists say in early adolescence, you start to think for yourself. You notice adults can be wrong and they don't always do as they say their children should. This new cognitive capacity to question and to analyze, it can be destabilizing. On a Sunday, you might ask questions like, is everybody at coffee hour actually this friendly and polite? Or are they just on their best behavior because they're at church? It's not for us to know. At school, you might say, are these kids actually my friends or do they secretly laugh at me? It's not for us to know. When you're alone, you might ask questions like, am I normal? Am I at least in the normal range for normal? At age 14, it's not for us to know. At 14, you start to ask questions like, if God didn't make the sun until the third day, how did he know the first two days had gone by? <laughs> or, if Cain was sent into the land east of Eden, where did he, the son of Adam and Eve, find a wife? Or, my personal favorite, if God can do anything, can he make a rock so big he can't pick it up? These questions aren't always trivia or word games. Jackie Dean mentioned what terrific questions Mala asked. She is the first confirmant in many years who had the guts to ask, why would God allow slavery and bigotry and oppression? These questions have answers, but they take a lot of study and reflection to find. And they still don't offer certainty. It would have been so much easier back in the days of Exodus. Every day an Israelite 14-year-old would have seen God's pillar of cloud. Every night they would have seen his pillar of fire. They'd have had that certainty of God's love, his presence, at a minimum, his existence. But even in Exodus, we read, the Israelites lost their faith in a God they could not see. And they made a golden calf. The struggle for certainty is not limited to religion. When Lily Tomlin said, reality is a collective hunch, we all laughed, she was closer to the truth than most of us realized. In physics, as they study the fundamental makeup of everything, they can develop hypotheses. They can't test those hypotheses because the subjects are particles vastly smaller than atoms. And a physicist will tell you, if you think you understand quantum physics, no, you don't. At the extremes of mathematics, the numbers continue to add up, but we can't say if they apply to anything in the reality we know or not. When someone recovers from cancer, we'll say, they're better now. But we all know they're better now is a shorthand for saying they've got such and such a percent chance of surviving another five years. I should probably apologize to everyone here who has anxiety. When you pile one uncertainty on top of another, it becomes terrifying. It's too much to think about. It's too easy to wave it away with unthinking rejection or the kind of blind faith that really isn't faith at all. It's just denial 
or mindless repetition of what we know we're supposed to say. When we just strive, when we try to reach certainty on any subject, it's like that pillar of black. You can see it clearly from a distance. It leads you in the right direction. But as you get close to the center, everything becomes misty and unclear. And the harder you try to grab hold of it, the more it slips out of your grasp. If the grown-ups in your life have let you down, you can be left asking, why should I believe in any of this? Let's remember our brains do not only think, they also feel. When you tell someone how you feel, they might say that's not logical. Technically, that may be true. But to say our feelings are not logical is like saying algebra is not geometry. Our logic and our emotions, our instincts, our intuition, they're two different tools that God has given us for two different jobs. And we've all had gut senses that we could not justify or ignore. I'm going to pivot a little here, so if you all will bear with me, I promise I'm going somewhere. Every year, the Goodyear Tire Company gets complaints from ranchers. As the blimp travels from one stadium to another, it flies over grazing lands. If it's a sunny day, the blimp's shadow may pass over a herd. And as the cattle are overshadowed, they are moved to awe and wonderment. Their instincts catch fire and they stampede. Airships, advertising, Major League Football, vulcanized rubber, the lifting power of helium, all these things are outside of a cow's cognitive capacity. It's not just that they don't know what a blimp is, they can't. This is what it's like for us in those rare, quiet moments of faith. The, the one day where you're struck by the light streaming in through the stained glass windows, or the way the gospel reading aligns perfectly with the worries on your mind. The still place your mind settles in when you reverently walk the labyrinth downstairs. These brief moments where we forget ourselves completely, let us know we are connected. We are a branch on a tree of faith rooted in the earliest biblical times. We're an irreplaceable cog in the machinery of God's creation. Just like a cow seeing the shadow of a blimp, we feel the presence of God as if a pillar of fire was lighting us up from within. We don't talk about these times much. They don't happen that often. And they're hard to put into words without slipping into hyperbole the way I just did. I wonder if Jesus told his apostles, it's not for you to know. Because with their education, with our limited human minds, they, could not, they couldn't really understand what the redemption of Jerusalem would even mean. Maybe these moments of mindful presence are the closest we can come to understanding. They don't bring us certainty rooted in facts, but they keep faith shining when all the evidence would tell us to despair. Of course, it's not every day a blimp passes directly overhead. Faith is both a gift and it's something that needs nurturing. Psalm 4610 instructs us, be still and know that I am God. Being still inside and out, that's easier said than done. But simply reading the Bible slowly, prayerfully, can help you uncover layers of meaning that you did not feel before. 
Just say in the Lord's Prayer to yourself on repeat until they stop being meaningful words can help light up that pillar of fire. The Irish missionary nun, Mother Mary Evangelista, said, if you empty yourself of yourself, you will find God, and I believe God will fill you up with God. There's a reason every major world religion has a tradition of contemplative practice. Years ago, I went for a walk alone on a spring day in upstate New York. Uh, weather is beautiful. I couldn't enjoy it because I was chewing over questions of faith. I wanted it, didn't have it, couldn't find a logical reason to accept it. I thought to myself, if there is a God, why doesn't he send me a sign? In the moment that followed, a flock of crows rose up from the trees and they flew across the Hudson River. Now, was this a sign or was it just an impressive coincidence? It's not for me to know, but I keep faith. Mala, Aaron, I hope both of you will keep asking questions as you go forward. I hope you'll seek out that silence, those moments of connection that light us up like a pillar of fire. And I hope you'll keep watch for the pillar of cloud that leads us on in faith, even if certainty always stays out of reach. <laughs>